On this time, it is my privilege to introduce you our next present, uh, presenter. He comes from Maguindanao family background. He married with Mirli Lim Adil, a registered nurse and a registered librarian serving as assistant librarian of Mountain View College. He blessed with three children, Karam Klero Jim, Karakrais Bai, and Karaklisia Bai. And uh, he recently finished his Doctor of Missiology, Intercultural Studies at the Asia Graduate School of Theology in Quezon City. He serves as a professor of mission and evangelism in the School of Theology and also part-time guidance counselor of Mountain V College. Our presenter is no other than Pastor Jimmy Giama V. Adel Jr. After his presentation, we'll be having a uh, question and answer, and his presentation entitled World Views, Aspirations, Folk Ways, and Percep uh, Perception of Folks Muslim, Promising Pathways for the Christian Mission. Pastor uh, Jimmy Adil, the floor is yours. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Peace, mercy, and blessings from Allah be upon us as we have this forum and as we celebrate the Sabbath. If it was not yet said, I want to express my appreciation to the organizing team for a very organized forum. You know, I came all the way from Mindanao, and so I think I have to express such gratitude for making us a part of this affair. When waiting, I want to acknowledge Dr. Agustin and Dr. Rosario, who were actually responsible for recommending me to go into missiology. Thank you very much. Because I know you may, have, you may not have the chance to read my acknowledgments in my dissertation. Who's keeping track of our time? So this is not yet counted. Where's Brother Sinaga? I mean, I'm making, you know, when Brother Sinaga was saying this morning that we are somehow indebted to Indonesia for bringing the batik to the Philippines, I take exception because I got mine from Sarawak, Malaysia, not from Indonesia. <laughs> I'm just making up my time, I mean,
Okay, uh, the presentation is actually a uh, what's this? It's an encapsulated form of my dissertation, and so I tried as much as possible to make it spiritual rather than academic, since uh, this is a Sabbath program also. So, in a nutshell, I wanted to see what are the other possibilities of approaching the Muslims. Now, considering the fact that about 70% of the Muslims all over the world are more on folk Islam. In fact, uh, I was given the chance to go to the Middle East last summer. I thought folk Islam is only common in countries outside the Middle East. That in the Middle East, we could see real Islam. That's what I thought. But when I was there, I found out that folk Islam is also alive. Behind the official practice of Islam, there is still folk Islam. So in other words, as Christ's messengers, we must deal with this reality that there is a vast difference between the book Islam and the lived Islam, between what we call the theoretical Islam and the street Islam. I also recognize a Pastor Manyes. Uh, Dr. Manyes was my a teacher in Greek readings in Jan, in Ayas before. No? So if he did not let me pass, I would not be here. Yeah, I mean, it's nice to remember old mentors, no? especially those who were kind to you. So, uh, I was trying to revisit not only physically but uh, theoretically the worldviews, the aspirations, and the folkways of my relatives in Maguindanao. No? As mentioned in the introduction, I come from a Maguindanao tribe, which is the largest Muslim tribe in the Philippines. So I still have connections with them because of my father, no? who passed on to my veins some Maguindanao blood. No? And until now, I still maintain contacts with my relatives. No? That's how I got into the community. No? The methodology I applied was ethnography. No? It took me to live with the people, converse with them, participate in some of their activities, and I even met some relatives of my father whom I did not meet before. No? And amazingly, they know the story of my father. No? Uh, they thought that he was just disgruntled in Islam, so he left. No? But I know the other version of the story of my father. No? Okay, so, so the official time begins now, or? <laughs> Never mind. Okay. So I bring you greetings from my family. Uh, I am bringing them back to the Maguindanao culture. Okay. And I said, my study is inspired by my father. This was one of the last pictures we took with him while he was around. And the other guy is my other son, who's in Ayas right now. So Islam has been unjustly misunderstood and misinterpreted. Misunderstood because, you know, when we look at Muslims, uh, what comes to our mind easily? Hmm? Violent, volatile, must be treated with suspicion, misinterpreted in the sense that there are different forms of Islam. And so negative labels have been attached to Islam and the Muslims, yet the Muslims all over the world have a high regard for their religion. I can show to you some data that tell us that indeed Muslims are very confident that there is no salvation outside Islam. What else? They are stat statistically fast growing and they are confident that soon they will overtake Christianity. In fact, uh, there was another research that projected what would be the future based on the current trend of Islam. And it's possible no, that by 2050, the Muslims will compose the world's population up to almost 30%. Now, the Maguindanaons, which is the tribe of my father. The Maguindanaons are one of the Muslim groups in the Philippines and one of the largest ethno-linguistic groups and the largest among the Islamized people in the Philippines, or peoples. However, the word Maguindanao connotes something else in the Philippines. No? We remember of barbaric killings, no? anomalies, and many others. So this is the map of Maguindanao. Can you see it? Of course. Can you read it? Of course not. No? So anyway, just imagine. No? 
Uh, the neighbors are North Cotabato, Sultan Kudarat, and Lano del Sur. Now, Islam, as it is lived out by the Maginanauns, is inseparably entwined with culture. According to one American who lived in Maguindanao, the Maguindanao cannot be understood apart from his religion. There is a, a close connection, an inseparable connection between culture and religion. Another missionary who also lived in Maguindanao said, the Maguindanao are still basically pagan in their way of life, but that they adhere, sorry, they adhere to what? They adhere to the religion of Islam. While I was conducting my study, I met a professor. You know, I was also given the chance to serve as a visiting professor of Mindanao State University in Maguindanao, no? since I also finished my first doctorate in MSU Marawi. No? And so when he met me and he learned that I was doing a research on Islam, he said, you cannot, this is what he said, which is interesting. He said, you would not see Islam in the lives of the people. You should read books to know what Islam really is. In other words, there is a disconnect between the book and the practice in Islam. However, we have to recognize that the Maguindanaons are still an unreached people group in the Philippines. Not even the Sulads, which is very aggressive in its uh, frontier missions, not even Sulads has penetrated Maguindanao. Okay. Now, this is a question posed by one author in our seemingly failure to reach out to the Muslims, especially folk Muslims. He said, has there been something missing in our understanding and preaching of the gospel so that we fail to reach the Muslim at this point of deepest insecurity? Does the Muslim's preoccupation with endless cycles of ritualistic cleansing point to another human problem as basic as sin? Do we need an approach to evangelism, discipleship, and contextualization which will meet people at this other point of need, could such an approach revolutionize outreach and church planting in some of the most resistant parts of the world? So these are questions that should uh, cause us to ponder as to how we are doing our work for Jesus. So I looked into the worldview, aspirations, and perceptions of this people group, the Maginanaons, and also considered their folk ways, religiosity, and openness to relate with Christians. And knowing these factors would empower or give us a, what, a theoretical base that would also present pathways for the Christian mission. So, you know, when you read the literature, when you go to the literature, there are many books that have been written on proven and triable, uh, triable ways of approaching the Muslims. But it seems to me that most of these are dealing with what we call theoretical Islam. I have yet to see more books that would deal really with folk Islam. And so this study was done. Okay. And especially to the Maguindanaons. Not, you know, not much has been done in the Maguindanaon area. So I applied the ethnographic method. For two months, I lived with the Muslims in the community and talked with them, joined their activities. And it was also their chance. You know, I asked. Or somehow I assess if they knew about the Christians. They know, they knew something about the Christians. When I ask them, do you know about the Adventists? Only two or three know about the Sabadista, okay? but very, very limited. So there is the, op the, the, the challenge for us, fellow Adventists. I conducted interviews, focus group discussions, participant and non-participant observations, and it was done in a village that was adjacent to the Mindanao State University. In other words, I was interested to see if MSU, being a prestigious university, has an influence on these ordinary people. Now, into the interior hills are the camps of the MNLF and the MALF. In fact, I visited one of these camps uh, with my friend who was an Ustad. And see, it's, it's really interesting no? how the influence of the scholars in the university and the extremist group really have an effect on these ordinary Muslims as to their practice. So this is the map again. Of course, it's not very colorful, and much more, it's not very clear. Okay. Now, what is the worldview? I'm now presenting to you my findings and conclusions. The worldview of the Maginanao, which I believe represents also the folk Muslims. Okay? Submission to the will of Allah is still very strong. 
They're fatalistic. Everything happens because of Allah or because of a known fate. And they're also superstitious. They practice many things, many rituals, which are characteristic of animism. They are afraid of spirits. Okay? So, I would conclude that the worldview of the Maguindanao Muslim is a syncretization of the indigenous and traditional Maguindanao belief system and cultural practices and the Islamic religious or religion which results to what is called folk Islam. In other words, at least in Maguindanao, why folk Islam is alive because of this combination of indigenous practices or belief system and Islam. They tried to compromise, in other words, aspirations. They have the need for respect and empowerment based on their distinctive religio-cultural identity. And I think what they really want from us, fellow Filipinos, is respect and trust and opportunities. Of course, they have these common felt needs. And I could also see religious ambivalence. Now, many of these respondents of mine were not even sure, no? if a particular practice is Islamic or non-Islamic. Okay? And it matters not whether they're highly educated or they are rich or poor. So in other words, folk Islam is not only true among the masses, but even among the intellectuals. Now, I ask them, what is a true Muslim? Now, these are their answers. No? He is religious, he has good character, his behaviors are good, and he is submissive to Allah. Subhanahu wa ta'ala, and holistic, very similar to the Adventist view of what is a good Christian. I asked them, how do you, how do you reckon your understanding of what is a true Muslim with these uh, barbaric acts of some fellows of yours? He said, you know, these are not true Muslims. They are only, they have the term moro or moro moro. In other words, these are not really followers of Islam. Now, how do they look at us, Christians? Now, they have positive views based on their experience with Christians in their areas, especially some Christians who had good influence them. However, they have more negative views about Christians than positive, especially our immodesty, immorality, dietary and hygienic practices, vices, violent acts, and non-observance of the teachings of the Bible. They said, you know, these Christians have the Bible, have their Bible, but they are not following their Bibles or the Bible. And they also suggest some ways by which the relationship of the Muslims and the Christians would be deepened. For example, it is said joint worship, study of the Quran and the Bible, symposia, communication between the respective leaders, correct understanding of their respective religions. In other words, they are cognizant of the fact that even they themselves do not understand their religion so well. Mutual help and respect to their religious observances. Now, I come to the practical aspect of my research. What can I recommend? Uh, there are some administrators here and some uh, think tanks of our church, so I hope you would consider this. No? Now, this paper is missiological rather than theological in design and intent, and so I'm more concerned of what we can suggest. Okay? So, to Adventists living in Muslim communities, and I believe this is also applicable even to other Muslim countries like Indonesia, Malaysia, and even in the Middle East. Okay? One, they either promote or they distort or distort Christianity. In other words, we must be conscious of our showing and much more our influence to Muslims because silently they are observing. We must give a right interpretation of the gospel and showcase the beauty of Christianity by positive attitudes and congruent lifestyle. Okay? Initiate to build bridges of understanding and friendship wherever you are. Maintain an atmosphere of openness, respect, trust, and support. Okay? And then as far as Christian principles allow, participate in the family and community events of the Muslims. Okay? Then, such as celebrations, weddings, funerals. By the way, uh, Muslims are very open because they have this belief that you know any goodness that comes from God must be shared. So even though you're not a relative, if you join in their celebrations, they welcome you. I tried that several times in Maguindanao. And then to our missiologists and also our missionaries, okay, restudy and redo. We need to always restudy and redo. Let's not say this was very applicable here, and so it follows that anywhere. No? It's not a universal methodology that we should always think about. 
In fact, Ellen White has this statement, no? we must not be stereotyped in our manner of working. Okay? Then, customize our approach. Again, we must differentiate between the theoretical and the practical, between the ideal Islam and the lived Islam, and between the book Islam and the street Islam. There's a vast difference. And so I am looking at some pathways. One is the worldview pathway. What is this? No? Their orientation, which is very divinistic, uh, in my operational definition, divinistic and fatalistic, uh, could be a pathway. In other words, if you are that submissive to the will of God or Allah, then why don't you submit also to all that he says? Okay. So we can present a Quranic theme that gives the assurance of the just and merciful God. You know, God to them is very transcendent, and so why don't we consider also presenting God in an immanate manner? Okay. And we can give stories. Muslims are very fond of stories. And then, uh, I'm skipping some. No? Another one. No? They always, now, have you observed Muslims? They always say, Insha'Allah. Insha'Allah. In other words, if God wills. That's why I tell my students, you know, the Muslims are even more biblical than us. No? Because they always say, Insha'Allah. When they make agreements, we will meet tomorrow, Insha'Allah. And that's actually what James said, right? Do not make agreements without uh, in involving Allah. And so here, the concept of insha'Allah could be a pathway also. No? In other words, if you are that submissive, then Allah has also a will for you uh, to study his other writings. Aspirations, yes, we can also address their needs, converse with them, listen to their stories. And then, folkways. Let's look at some other folkways, my friends, and see how we can translate this no? by using functional substitutes, according to missiologists. No? Functional substitutes. Okay. Now lastly, no? let's go back to the incarnational model of Jesus Christ, who lived, who became a human being, and lived with humanity. And let's go back to the early Muslim missionaries who came to the Philippines, my friends. Remember, why was Islam so fast in its uh, widespread in the Philippine soil? Now let's enumerate. The Muslim missionaries lived with the natives. They even, even married some women. They established their families. They learned the dialect. They ate the food. Why are we, I mean, why can't we do that also? Let's reverse, no? Live with the Muslims, uh, learn their dialect, married some other women. <laughs> no? Okay, so we can learn from such model, my friends. So here is now my proposed model. This is the final output of my paper. I still have one hour and 40 minutes, okay? I am proposing this to our administrators, okay, who are here, or to those of you who are strategizing. No? One, choose an earnest, courageous, and faithful Adventist to study seriously the Quran and learn the Arabic language so to be able to accurately read, chant, and interpret convincingly the message of the Quran. You know, Muslims generally have a high regard for someone who knows Arabic. And he must also be proficient in biblical theology and skilled in human relations. He will settle in a Muslim community, learn the local dialect quickly, and establish his profession or livelihood and family no? among the residents in a humble bearing and identify himself as a follower of Isa al Masih and exemplify in his lifestyle obedience to the Quran and the Bible and submission to the will of Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala. He must have laudable qualifications. You know, Muslims are very particular with degrees, titles, positions. So somebody who has also maybe a PhD or at least someone who can be respected. No? And if he knows the Sharia, okay, you know, people also, have, I mean, Muslims have a high regard for someone who knows their laws. Okay? And preferably, he is still young. And so that disqualifies me. No? You might think that I'm proposing something for me. No, He must still be young so that he can learn fast and serve in the community in such capacity for a longer time. He should be cooperative with the activities in the community and support the people in their endeavors for prosperity and lasting peace. But he must be honest and courageous to tell the Muslims what is against the teachings of the Quran and tell them that such principle is also found in the Bible. A few seconds. He cannot camouflage himself as a Muslim as it could at any time create trouble for himself and the standing organization. Yeah? Like wearing a Muslim attire, carrying a Quran anywhere, uttering Arabic words and phrases in his conversations, must first be ascertained if such gestures are appreciated. You know, some Muslims are very jealous. When they know that you're not a Muslim and you are, you know, doing some of their ways, they said, no, 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 no. no. Lastly, no? I, anyway, anyway, here, no? Such methodology should not entail big expenses more than his provision for his family. He must live simply 
Because to them, that's what we call submission. So if you're extravagant in your, in your gadgets, in your car, then say, this is not submission. Okay? So such approach would probably work out in Muslim communities in the Philippines since they are usually friendly and sincere and are willing to trust an outsider when it is proven that he has no evil intentions in their place. Such model of missions is incarnational in approach and respectfully enters the mind and heart of a people through their worldview, aspirations, focus, religiosity, and openness. So this is my diagram. No? So here is the Christian mission symbolized by the cross. It seeks to penetrate the Muslim, that uh, figure of a man there, through these factors that influence him so much. So such model also contextualizes the incarnational approach and applies the tent-making model pattern after the example of the Apostle Paul who made tents to support himself and as a means to connect with the people. Okay? By living and working among the Muslims, Adventists can give a credible testimony about their faith and hope. Their presence and patience would gently lead the Muslims into knowing more about Isa al Masih and his plan of salvation. Lastly, such approach follows the example of Jesus Christ who mingled with men as one who desired their good, showed his sympathy for them, ministered to their needs, and won their confidence, then he bade them, follow me. So I believe that model applies what Ellen White has counseled. So I'm now open for questions. Thank you so much, Doctor, for a very informative um, presentation. Now we open our question and answer only one question since our time is very limited. Is there any question? Okay, only one. Thank you. Would you mind to? Thank you very much, doctor, for the presentation. My question is, because you have presented that the, the Muslims are suspicious to us, and Christians also are suspicious to them. In your Thomas experience living with them, did you identify yourself to be a Christian? And did you at least remove that suspicious mentality between them and you and between you and them? Thank you. If they are suspicious about us, we cannot do anything about that. No? But what about us? No? Why are we suspicious of them? So, you know, that is one barrier that we have in our ministry. If in the first place we are suspicious, we cannot trust them, and then how can we approach them? If you got to be killed, and that's it. Okay. Now, secondly, <laughs> secondly, how did I appear to them? I told them I'm a Christian. I'm an Adventist. I said Adventist because they didn't like the word Christian. They remember Christendom, you know, the Crusades. I said I'm, a, I'm an Adventist, and we are very close. Okay. So, uh, I mean, if you pretend to be a Muslim and later you will be found out that you're not, then it would be more dangerous. You know? And they, they're okay. I mean, now, my advantage was, I said, I have relatives there. Secondly, I was given the chance to teach at that university, that state university, and so I brought my idea. I'm a university professor. So that was the advantage at the time I was doing my ethnography. You know? Let's give hands to Dr. Jim. And now it's the time for the next presentation. <laughs> 